Thanks for that welcome. Um, Nicholas, uh, great to speak to you here. Uh, Atomico has been a company I've been writing about an awful lot because you seem to be doing an awful lot. Um, so you have a theory, you've, du you've dubbed it entrepreneur-led investing. What does that actually mean in practice? Yeah, so you know, when we started Atomico 10 years ago now, we thought there was a need in Europe and in general actually for founders to invest in, in other founders. Because you know, to build a company, you know, as, a, as a founder, you, you, you really, it's good to get you know, mentorship and advice from people who have done it before. People have done mistakes and have some successes. So, you know, so that's very much in the, the heart of what we're doing at Atomico. But also what's fantastic to see now over the last few years is that because of the rise of so many successful European companies, there have been you know, 40 companies after Skype that reach a billion dollar valuation from Europe, which means that there's at least you know, 40 founders you know, that have created billion dollar companies here in Europe. So we see now more and more of these founders starting to invest in next generations, and that's really, really good. And that's pr primarily is happening on the seed level, where 10% of the seed rounds today are, um, um, you know, have founders investing. So I think that, you know, founders are, you know, we talk about, you know, sometimes we hear about dumb money. Well, you know, getting money from founders, that's the smartest money you can get. Right. Okay. So, how do you how do you get founders to be part of your venture firm? I mean, uh, how how do you get these people to swallow their egos and be part of uh, part of what you're building. So you know, we've been you know we're thinking about how how do we you know you know develop ourselves as as, as, as an organization, and the more and more we we do this, investing in other companies, you you know we're understanding more and more that it's all about being collaborative, and companies you know that we're investing in are more you know more likely to be successful if they have a set of good good founders around them. So one thing I'm super excited about you know. Today is that we're announcing that we're joining up with some of Europe's most successful founders. So you have uh, who, who are you know starting to you know part, uh, invest together with Atomico. So we have people like Brent Hoberman, um, um, Ilka Panan, and Mikko Kordesoya, the founders of Supercell, Alex Asili, co-founder of, of uh, Jawbone, starting to work with us as a role of what we call entrepreneur partners. What this means is that these guys are, have already been investing in companies. You know, doing angel investments. Now they're also starting to work with us and help us to find companies. And we are also providing our infrastructure for them to, to uh, continue to do their investments. But they're, you know, they're still working you know, full time you know, with their day jobs, but they're joining us in this entrepreneur partner role. So this is something that for me I'm super excited about is because that means that ultimately that companies that we are supporting, getting support from and advice from more, more, more very, very experienced founders. Uh I mean, that, that's a very interesting move. These are some of the most prominent European um, tech entrepreneurs that they've been. Uh, and we've spoken about this in the past. One of the deficits, as well as the lack of venture capital uh, that has been in Europe traditionally anyway, is the lack of experience in, in scaling up a business, getting beyond the startup phase. So uh, how, uh, how are these guys in, in practice going to be assisting your po portfolio? Is it just an advice thing? It's a, it sounds like it's co-investments as well. So, you know, it's both, both, you know, advising companies, co-investing in companies. But, you know, one thing with, you know, people who have been around have experienced, just having, you know, half an hour, you know, on a fo phone call or a meeting with, with someone like Alex, you know, he, he can explain, you know, some of these, you know, experiences he've had. That can be, you know, immensely um, beneficial for a founder. So this is all about, you know, high impact advice. So, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about Europe's place in the, in the world of tech. As a founder of Skype, it's probably the continent's most prominent uh, tech success. Um, and you at Atomico produced research to show that more unicorns, billion dollar tech companies, have emerged from outside Silicon Valley. Uh, than inside Silicon Valley. But even looking at those numbers, about 40% are still in this tiny area in the world. Um, so what's your argument for saying that there's more innovation in Europe and other places outside this kind of traditional hub? So, you know, I think it's quite remarkable. And, and you know, 10 years ago, you know, when, when we sold Skype, you know, we, 
you know, people thought that was really the exception that, you know, great companies will not come from Europe. But look now, you know, here, what we have had so many, many successful companies. So it's, it's you know, it's a fact that, that we have some, some of the world's best companies coming from Europe and we should all celebrate and be proud of that and say, you know, look at what are the things that are great about Europe. And I think what's really interesting for me, if you, you know, if you look at, you know, the next, you know, 10 years and some of the macro trends is that, you know, the next billion smartphones is, are going to come from, uh, new markets from emerging markets. So what this means is that regardless where companies coming from, the reliance on your home market is becoming less and less important, even for US companies. So comp companies who are coming from small countries, if it's from, say, Finland or Sweden or, you know, Netherlands or Switzerland, you know, with a very small domestic market, the founders there are forced to think about the global markets from day one. So I think this is actually something that in the past that was a disadvantage to come from a small domestic market. I think it's now we're in a tipping point where this is starting to become uh, an opportunity. So companies from small markets go global much, much earlier than, than companies from, from big markets. The other thing that's interesting, I think now, it, you know, it's less and less about pure technology innovation. It's much more about utilizing technology building block to disrupt and transform non-technology sectors. So for example, if you want to be in fintech, you know, London is, you know, London and New York are probably the best cities in the world to be in because there's, that's where the financial industries are. If you want to be, you know, in, in, in you know, design, of course, that's also, you know, London is, is great. So it's actually, you know, some of these things that used to be a disadvantage actually is to some extent becoming ad an advantage. Do you think there's a problem still though with getting beyond the billion mark, getting to the 10 billion, we haven't actually achieved that yet. What are the things that Europe need to put in place uh, in the infrastructure to, to, to get to those sorts of numbers? Yeah, I think we need, we need time. I'm, I'm convinced that it will happen, you know, when we sit here, whether that's in, in, you know, in 10 years or in five years, I don't know when it is, but I'm convinced that we will have companies in Europe which are, you know, tens of billions of dollars of valuations, companies which are employing thousands of people, companies which are also starting to acquire other companies. And this is a matter of time. And you have a few companies now with, you know, European companies which are continuing to, to build. And, 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 you know, what we have more and more of is uh, the founders, the cohorts of founders now are much more, um, you know, they have more confidence than they had, you know, 10 years ago and, you know, more support. The thing, though, that we still are lacking is, is funding. You know, while we have great funding on earlier stages, you know, seed funding and Series A, pretty much on par with U.S. in terms of opportunities. But when it comes to uh, late stage funding, so Series B and later, U.S. still has 14 times as much capital. Right. So that's one of the gaps that, you know, we're trying to, you know, fill, uh, you know, atomical, you know, so, so we can really help these companies to scale, not only with, you know, of course, with, with capital, but also helping them to scale, you know, grow into new markets you know, and expand their businesses. Uh, uh, that's a really important point about the late stage funding. Uh, I'm flying in from London. There's tons of new seed, small venture capital funds, less of the big funds like, uh, like yours that you do see uh, in the Valley. And in fact, the, if you look at the numbers, the late stage funding, a lot of it is coming from the US. So the, these groups are coming in and selecting the best companies because they've been able to scale to a certain size. Do you think there's a risk because of this funding gap that the great benefit of Europe's tech renaissance will actually be uh, felt in the US after all because they're the ones that are forking over the cash? Yeah, I mean, ironically, so that there is a bit of, you know, we're building these great companies and then, you know, when they really become successful, we're transferring the ownership to, to US investors. <laughs> right. But I think this is changing, though. We see, you know, now, you know, when we're talking to our limited partners, you know, the you know, big pension funds here in Europe and, and, and others, there's an increased appetite to in, invest in, in European tech companies. You know, when we raised money, may say, you know, four years ago, I tried to avoid mentioning venture capital in Europe in the same sentence because I wouldn't get any money. Today, you, you, you know, you can go in and speak to, to big pension funds and you, you, you talk about, you know, European venture capital and they say, yeah, that's interesting. So it's actually, the, the tide has shifted. Uh and are you seeing um, uh, European companies actually want to uh, avoid the trap? Well, not really the trap, because uh, 
uh, as, as you've seen, you've become a very wealthy person and, and, and done very well out of selling uh, companies at a re relatively early stage, We're uh, in the sense that you can, you, Skype could have become a 10 billion, 20 billion do dollar business um, it, uh, and, uh, and, and do that. Do you see the willingness to stay uh, independent um, longer here, or do you actually think that eventually a good exit is a good exit and you would advise uh, a company in your portfolio to, to sell um, to, a, to a US company because that's a good exit. So, you know, we always try to encourage entrepreneurs to think big and think long term. We try to avoid talking about exit strategies, it's about building great companies. And, uh, you know, great companies get acquired rather than being sold. And, you know, so, but it's always case by case. Sometimes it's the right time, you know, to, to sell and then that, that might be fine. It's always about being supportive of the founders, what they want to do. But for sure, you know, we, we certainly try to encourage uh, entrepreneurs to, to hold on to their companies longer. But also, I think that it's also something that you start to see, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, in, not a lot of them, but several are, you know, hanging on to their companies. And, and by the way, the sales are no longer only to US companies. You know, also, you know, um, Asian companies are acquiring as well as so you have companies like, you know, SoftBank, obviously acquired um, uh, uh, Supercell last year. But you have, you know, some of the big Chinese companies are starting to make investments as well. So, I think you're starting to have an international exit market as well. Uh, one thing about the internationalization of it, and I'm sorry to keep harking back to what Silicon Valley is doing, but Silicon Valley is having a period where there's a reassessment of tech valuations at the moment. It, it, it seems um, uh, there's been this period where we went from a handful of unicorns to 140 odd. And it seemed like entrepreneurs were really hoping to get this tag. It gave them cachet. It was able to uh, uh, able to get the best talent and you know get into the best parties as well. I'm sure. But to do that, they had to give up preferential terms. And now, if they don't grow into that valuation, uh, they're going to get hurt on the on the downside. Do you think that uh, we might see the same thing in Europe as well? So, you know, the, what you talked about, the, this uh, very, in, um, high valuations at a very late stage for really big companies. You know, companies which, you know, in the past typically were public, you know, have this kind of semi, you know, pub, you know they're pu private rounds, but they're almost like, like private rounds, uh, public, public companies. And that's something because you have had the influx of um, uh, investors who typically were not venture capital investors coming into the market. That's something we've seen in the US to some extent in China as, as well. We haven't really seen that in Europe, so I don't think that, and I think that's something that maybe we see in the US, um, as you probably see less and less of that now. It's a little bit of a softening in the market, but I think because we haven't had so much capital in Europe, I think whatever's happening on the, on the you know, pricing, we're gonna see a lesser impact here in Europe. Uh, I mean, are, are you sure? I mean, we, we, we're seeing things in the late stage of people, like you say, these Chinese investors, Asian investors, much more traditional, investment houses getting into it, they're going to they're gonna look at quick returns instead of what you do, which is think about very, very long-term uh, returns. And there must be some impact about uh, when the, this kind of tech bubble I, I've been describing as not bursting, but deflating. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there is, I mean, for sure, we're seeing in general, you know, the last, you know, six months or so, it's certainly been a softening in, in, in the market and investors a little bit more hesitant and, and uh, but at the end of the day, it's about you know it's about investing in great founders who are building great businesses and um, and and uh, you know the prices you know in general prices through from seed to late stage rounds in Europe the median prices you know last year or 14 I should say in Europe was about half U.S. prices. Right. So you know so you know to the extent the prices are coming down in US the price is going to come down less here in Europe because it was just as, you know it was less of an inflation inflation on the prices in the start for in the first place okay and atomica just by its size and it and its recent successes has kind of vaulted into this top tier of venture capital groups in in Europe are you seeing now that there's more interest in tech groups uh, across Europe that there's more competition for those deals that, that, than there, uh, there wasn't uh, once was, and actually doesn't that move uh, to, uh, against your benefit in the in, in the long run? Yeah. So there, you know, I think 
uh, investors in general are seeing more and more the, you know, opportunities in Europe. But having said it, there's still, you know, we still have a big funding gap. The average size of European venture funds are $35 million. There are very, very few funds which are more than you know, half a billion. You know, we're raising a new fund now. It's going to be bigger than the last fund. And it's, it's not that many investors around. And, and, but the other way, though, is, as I mentioned before, we believe more and more in, in being collaborative. So, you know, it's actually good for companies to have a few different investors. It's not just about winning one deal. It's about, you know, having investors who can be complementary to each other and ultimately support the company. So, you know, I think it's uh, the number of opportunities we see in Europe are growing much faster than we see new investors coming into the, you know, you know, you know, establishing themselves. So, you know, we have, you know, last year we had twice as many Series A rounds compared to 2011. So there's the next five years you're going to see more and more good companies coming out, and the quality of these companies are getting better and better because there's so much experience today. Okay, and and I know we've only got a minute or so left, but we've we've got politicians in the audience and uh, and regulators uh, uh, and so on. Do you have any message for them uh, 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 about what uh, the kind of uh, the atmosphere that's been building up in Europe about uh, around regulation and uh, and tech at the moment? You know, one thing that always strikes me when I'm meeting politicians and and uh, uh, specifically European politicians, they talk about the problems. And I think they need to change mindset and start talking about opportunities and start celebrating success because there are so many good entrepreneurs, so many good uh, companies here, and there's something that works. And we should just uh, you know, support them more and more. And, um, and, and you know, the other thing is that I haven't heard any startup company who says that they need protection. You know, so, you know, companies, and I haven't heard any company saying like, well, I'm not going to start a company because of this or that regulation. Yes, you know, we have some, you know, it's complicated with some employment laws. Yes, it's complicated with stock options across borders, but it doesn't stop anyone from starting a company. Okay, Nicholas, I think we've run out of time, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.